1939, the Royal Navy was outfitting its newest class of destroyer when it became clear that something was badly wrong. The ship was leaning to and fro at its fitting out wharf, and it hadn't even reached the open ocean yet. At sea, it would probably completely capsize and roll over. There was a serious issue that had gone surprisingly unnoticed during the design phase, and it would have dramatic consequences. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs, and here are some more fascinating ship design fails from history. In the late 1930s, the British Admiralty was preparing for an impending war with Germany because at the time, it seemed like an inescapable likelihood. If a war broke out, the burden of defending Britain's coasts and trade would fall to the world-famous Royal Navy, so much effort was put into upgrading warships and phasing out older types wherever possible. By the late 1930s, the Admiralty had realised it needed two completely different kinds of destroyers. These handy warships were like a Swiss army knife. They were capable of doing many different tasks, but some would need to be specialised to accomplish specific roles. The Royal Navy needed destroyers for fleet work, that is, serving alongside warships to engage enemy fleets in open ocean. They prioritised speed and a heavy torpedo armament. But by contrast, the Navy also needed modern escort destroyers. These were smaller and easily mass manufactured. The escort destroyers would protect the slow, vulnerable merchant convoys from enemy U-boats and surface warships, as well as aircraft. In the First World War, this type of warship was called a sloop, and not a destroyer, because a sloop is not designed for big fleet deployments, but simple convoy escort work. They were typically slow, no faster than 20 knots, when most fleet destroyers could steam along at 30 or more, but they were cheap, and they were useful. In late 1938, a design specification was issued for a new type of fast escort ship to help out with convoy duties. They had to be about 1,000 tonnes, achieve speeds of about 30 knots, and be kitted out with a powerful anti-aircraft armament. But crucially though, they also needed to be easily mass manufactured and cheap to produce. Rather than start from scratch, and with the outbreak of war looming dangerously close, the Admiralty design team under the naval architect Sir Stanley Goodall took the recently introduced HMS Bittern, an escort sloop, and decided to base their design off of that. The plan was to use Bittern as a basis and upsize her to create a new, larger, and more powerful class of convoy escort warship. If that were all the design team had to accomplish, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem, but as always, bureaucracy crept in. The new class of ship would be expected to lend a hand in fleet actions as well, if necessary, meaning they would also need to be fast. The design team got to work. The new ships would be called the Hunt class. First, Bitten's design was slightly lengthened from about 266 feet to 278 feet, and her beam was narrowed from 37 feet to 28 feet 10 inches. A greater length, a narrower width, or beam, would make the ship faster through the water. On top of this, the draft, which is the amount of ship below the waterline, was reduced from 8 foot 5 inches to about 7 foot 9 inches. Now hopefully, this is ringing some alarm bells for you already, because surprisingly, apparently it didn't do so for the design team. When equipped with powerful Parsons turbines outputting some 19,000 shaft horsepower, the Hunts should have been able to achieve speeds close to about 30 knots. As part of their escort duties, the Hunts would need to protect from German aircraft. They would need a heavy anti-air defence armament and sea-keeping behaviour that would make it easier to aim the guns. The first part of that equation was easy enough. For main armament, the Hunt class copied HMS Bittern. They would mount three turrets, each with a pair of four-inch dual-purpose guns, for a total of six guns. Now the Hunt class had their anti-air armament, the designers went to work ensuring they could aim them easier. A ship's designer can actually influence just how much the ship rolls in the water. We've looked at this on the channel before. It has to do with the ship's metacentric height. For a ship designed to engage aircraft like the Hunt class was, a long, slow roll would be better than a quick, snappy one. If the ship was rolling slower, and more predictably, it would make the guns easier to aim, so the Hunt class needed a low metacentric height. This was calculated with complex mathematics by the design team, and checked by Sir Stanley himself. But off the bat, Sir Stanley had his reservations. In his daily diary, he wrote that he felt that the design team was, quote, poor and they might need more supervision, but in the rush to rearm and upgrade the Royal Navy in the face of a war, 
Goodall's remit was completely overloaded with projects that all required his attention and sign off. Unfortunately, it meant that several obvious signs that the Hunt class would be a disaster went unnoticed all the way from the drawing board to construction. Upsizing a ship's design, like that of the Bitten class sloop, is actually quite difficult because it means all the careful calculations that were made to ensure the stability and good sea keeping need to be done and done again. The first Hunt class ship, HMS Atherstone, went down the slipway in December 1939 and was completed, ready for duties in March 1940, but tests showed some alarming behaviours. Before even putting to sea, at the fitting out wharf it was found that Atherston was dangerously unstable, which was a serious, serious problem because the first 20 Hunt class ships were already ordered and under construction, nearing completion. Atherston, with her anti-air turrets mounted high up, seemed likely to capsize in anything more than a moderate sea. Something had gone terribly wrong. The complex mathematics required to calculate the ship's centre of buoyancy and its rolling motion had taken the design team some time to calculate, but somewhere somebody had made a mistake in their math. Basing the Hunt's design on the Bittern class sloop meant concessions would need to be made, and in the quest for more speed it should have already been setting off alarm bells that the Hunt class would be required to mount a heavy defensive armament high up on the superstructure while also being significantly narrower than the Bitten class. Early on, Sir Stanley had actually caught wind of this issue and he figured that the beam would need to be increased. Before Atherston, the first Hunt class ship was laid down, the beam was increased by 9 inches, but clearly it wasn't enough. To account for the additional heavy guns and the need for a specific metacentric height to provide a stable platform, lots of calculations were done around the predicted vertical centre of gravity. In fact, so much mathematics were done for these ships that each new design ended up with its own class book of calculations. This was full of formulas and information that was checked and signed off by Sir Stanley Goodall, but it seems like he, the design team, and even a second independent calculator brought in to check the figures missed a simple error. In calculating the predicted centre of gravity, a figure of 7 feet was given from the keel to the upper deck instead of the actual 17 feet. This meant that a huge amount of weight was emitted from the equation from low down in the ship. Thinking they had more to play with, the designers essentially stacked more weight up on top and didn't realise they were too light down at the bottom of the ship. The independent checker should have caught this, but they didn't. Instead they just copied the figures, the final numbers lined up, the calculations looked right, and the design was approved. A year and a bit later, the Hunt class ships lolled in the water pathetically without even going to sea. So with a dud series of ships, the Admiralty design team got back to the drawing board. Clearly not much could be done for the 20 or so Hunt class ships that were already completed or underway. For these ships, known as Batch 1, one of the three 4 inch gun turrets was removed, the funnel's height was cut down, and some of the superstructure around the bridge was removed, giving the ships a leaner silhouette. No less than 50 tonnes of cement were poured in to the bottom to provide additional ballast and weigh down the ship below. Now that would do for the first lot, but it was far from ideal. The ships had needed to carry a full battery of six guns, not just four. The Admiralty design team caught their error. The Hunt class's beam was increased from a mere 28 foot 3 inches to 32 foot 6 inches. The simple change to the ship's width ensured all six guns could be fitted as intended. In the end, 86 Hunt class ships were built. They did a fine job during the war, but the inglorious start to their career was an avoidable embarrassment. It can probably be chalked up to an overworked team rushing to get a design through as quickly as possible with the best of intentions and then a senior overseer like Sir Stanley who was just as overworked and preoccupied. But while Britain was preparing to face the might of the German Navy, it turns out that the Germans were making some design blunders of their own. If there's one thing that can be said for German warships it's that they are extremely pretty with their long, sleek silhouettes. But it was exactly this quality that early on meant that some of Germany's battleships functioned almost more like submarines than surface ships. In the early to mid 1930s, Germany was hurriedly rearming its navy, pouring hundreds of millions of marks into replacing the grand fleet it had lost following the First World War. The resultant surface warships actually took a lot of internal design cues from First World War ships as far as armour layout and things like that, but essentially they were designed for close range engagements in the Atlantic and North Sea, and especially for hunting down allied merchant ships and convoys. Early on, the surface warships were given relatively small calibre main guns. The famous pocket battleships like Admiral Scheer were designed as a kind of heavy cruiser, 
but in 1935, Nazi Germany committed to building proper battleships with the sisters Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. These were formidable modern fast battleships that mounted 9, 28 cm or 11 inch guns, a small caliber as far as battleships go, but one ideal for picking apart merchant ships. The real secret to their success was their speed, an impressive 30 to 31 knots, thanks in part to the immensely powerful triple steam turbines outputting some 160,000 shaft horsepower, but the speed was derived from that power plant coupled to the hull shape. The battleships were long and narrow, a hull form ideal for cutting through the water like a hot knife through butter. It would make the pair a deadly duo, able to engage and disengage the enemy at will, attack a convoy with impunity before escaping quickly into a developing rain squall if the resistance proved too dangerous. They would be quick. Another feature of the ship's design to enhance their speed was the bow shape, a straight stem. The stem is the very front of the ship and it gives the bow its shape. In the glory days of the ocean liner back in the late 18 and early 1900s, designers had toyed with a variety of shapes for their stems and the ever-growing quest for speed. Cunard Line introduced Mauritania and Lusitania in 1907 with very straight stems. A straight stem differs significantly from a raked stem, which introduces an angle to the bow. An angled or raked stem essentially provides more bow structure, meaning there is more buoyancy, simply more ship to float. It means that a ship with a raked bow is more likely to ride over the waves comfortably, as the raked stem and bow is lifted by the ocean. But a straight stem, by contrast, has less buoyancy. It means the ship will cut straight through a wave and maintain its speed. Lusitania and Mauritania, with their straight stems, could easily cut through massive Atlantic swells and maintain their fast, record-breaking crossing times, but they also exhibited some strange behaviours. One of my favourite stories is from the Mauritania. The straight stem gave the ship a weird tendency to drop suddenly underfoot, something that occasionally startled passengers. Once, her captain dressed up to the nines for dinner, went quickly to the bridge to check that all was well before heading below, when suddenly, in the face of a big wave, Mauritania's bow dropped, and the wave rolled up the bow, crashing over the bridge wing, dousing the captain completely in seawater. Designers back then used to account for this loss of buoyancy forward with an emphasised shear, that is, an exaggerated angle on the ship's deck. As the bow narrows, the shear line flicks up dramatically, providing, once again, simply more ship's structure to float and prevent any unwanted dropping by the head. Scharnhorst and Gneisenau were each designed with straight stems to emphasise their speed. In fact, most of those early Nazi German surface warships were, including the pocket battleships and even the modern heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper. Scharnhorst and Gneisenau went for their sea trials, and they sure were fast, but then their bows started dropping into the sea. The straight stem meant that there just wasn't enough buoyancy for the ship to ride over waves, which, to be fair, is exactly what the designers had wanted. They wanted their ships to cut through the waves instead, but with such low, sleek hull forms there was barely any freeboard, that is to say barely any ship above the waterline to begin with. Lusitania and Mauritania had tall hulls. It meant that they could deal with the heavy seas, even with a straight, narrow bow. Scharnhorst and Gneisenau were the opposite, and even worse, they had relatively little shear to account for it. They shipped tons and tons of water over the bow when the sea was up, and waves were bigger. With the forward decks awash, the seawater found its way through ventilation ducts and hatches to flood the inner workings of the bow and cause short circuits in wiring around the first gun turret. Now this was obviously not okay, and it became pretty obvious that some serious modifications were needed. Scharnhorst and Gneisenau were both held up while their bow section was redesigned. The old, straight stem was cut away, and a new raked shape was added instead. The anchors, which had sat in hawse pipes on the side of the hull, were moved to sit up on deck because, with decks awash, they were likely to be ripped away. The new bow came to be known as the Atlantic Bow, and it turned out that Scharnhorst and Gneisenau weren't the only ships that actually needed them. The surviving pocket battleships, like Admiral Scheer, had their bows replaced, so did the brand new heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper. Then the famous Bismarck, newly launched, was given one too, but her sister ship, Terpitz, didn't have a completed hull yet, so she was actually launched with the new raked bow installed. For Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, the fix didn't totally remedy the issues, but it did enough to prevent serious flooding. Now they rode the waves a little easier instead of sinking under them, but it was still common in heavy seas for the ships to travel with their forward gun turrets traversed to point backwards to prevent damage to the gun barrels from any unusually large waves. 
The fact was, they had such little freeboard and such a shallow shear line, they would be doomed to ship water over their bows for the rest of their careers. To be fair, this problem wasn't unique to the German battleships. Other warships from the time, including Allied surface vessels, became known as wet ships for doing the same thing. But for the Germans, the issue was serious enough as to require a full redesign and refit for most of their big surface warships. Lastly, here's a short one for you, and it has to do with Titanic, but not in the way that you might think. We all know about the ship's design shortcomings, we've actually covered them in exhaustive detail on this channel before, but one stands out because, on the night of the sinking, it caused some proper confusion. Titanic was the second in a trio of sister ships, the first being RMS Olympic. The ship took a number of design cues from older White Star liners, and clearly one of the great Edwardian pastimes at sea was walking. Early White Star Line ships featured lots of lovely long promenades for people to get fresh air and stretch their legs. On Olympic, the designers gave first class no more than three massive promenades. The first was up on the exposed boat deck at the top of the ship, then below that was the open promenade on A deck that ran the length of the superstructure, and then below that could be found a fully enclosed promenade space to protect passengers from the elements, with natural light coming through from big square windows that could all be hand cranked open. Now early on it became clear that this was just too much. Passengers enjoyed having some enclosed promenade space, but three dedicated promenades was just too much and a huge waste of space. The designers fixed this on Titanic, deleting the B-deck promenade almost entirely and installing new and insanely luxurious suites and staterooms in its place. Up on A-deck though, they did something interesting. They provided first class passengers a kind of half and half experience, with the forward section of the promenade being enclosed with a screen and windows, the same that we use on Olympic's B-deck promenade, and the aft section was left open. It gave Titanic's exterior a unique look, and it solved the problem well, except that there was one huge issue that was completely overlooked. See, the promenade deck wasn't just a space for passengers to stretch their legs, it was also meant to play a crucial part in the ship's evacuation during a potential disaster. Olympic and Titanic's evacuation plan called for passengers to meet on the promenade deck on A deck to wait to get into the lifeboats. The boats were stored up above on the boat deck. With passengers waiting below and out of the way in an orderly fashion, it would give the crew enough space to ready the boats and swing them out. The boats would be brought to the level of the open promenade on A deck, and passengers could step up on a small stool, climbing out through the railing and into the boat. Easy enough. But, on the night of April 14th the morning of the 15th, this plan was actually put into action and found severely wanting. After his ship had hit the iceberg, Captain Smith ordered the lifeboats be readied, swung out and lowered down to A deck, as was standard practice. He had been captain of Olympic before that and had done such lifeboat drill on that ship. The crew got to work and passengers waited down on A deck, but those early boats encountered an issue. Smith had forgotten that Titanic had one whole half of its promenade deck enclosed. It meant that passengers couldn't get through. The windows had to be hand cranked down. Lifeboat 4 on the port side was actually lowered down to A deck before they realised the windows were closed and couldn't be opened without the handles. Somebody was sent to fetch some, and then the crew moved on to lowering other lifeboats. Lifeboat 4 was left swinging there empty for most of the evacuation until finally a member of the crew had got a handle and managed to crank some of the windows down. The passengers were fed awkwardly through the open windows into the boat, and it was lowered away a full hour after it had been swung out in the first place, at 1.50am only 25 minutes before the ship was gone for good. It is only a minor design error, in the end most of the boats were boarded from the boat deck and it wasn't a big deal, but it seems incredible that it should have been overlooked in the first place, so it needs to go down in history as one of the great maritime design fails. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.